Today we're going to be talking about the Wan Dynasty in China. If that name sounds familiar, it's because they're the Mongols. All right, let's begin. So, our Wan Dynasty, we see it comprises of most of modern day China. It also has Mongolia. It has North parts of North Korea, parts of Russia. It was a humongous empire. Okay, so we see our Wan dates 1279 to 1368. Does that 1279 ring a bell? Well, I hope it does, because we know 1279 was the end of the Sung dynasty. We sung about it in our Mongol song. So, the Mongols wind up going, conquering northern China earlier, and finally subduing the Sung dynasty in 1279 AD. When Kublai Khan defeated the Sung Empire, he goes and does something unprecedented, surprising. Instead of saying, Now you are part of Mongolia, he says, We are China. We are the Wan Dynasty. So you'd think that it's going to be pretty good for the Chinese, and unfortunately that is not going to be the case. So one of the first things the Mongols do is they set up four social classes. Of course, at the top of this class system were going to be the Mongols themselves. They were the rulers. It just took being Mongolian for you to have the most rights, the most freedoms, the best job if you wanted it. The problem, however, was there wasn't enough Mongols to rule such a large empire. Particularly, there weren't enough educated Mongols, so their next group is going to be the foreigners who are going to hold the majority of the government jobs. Now, you might be saying, Mr. Kenny, what does the word foreigner mean? And foreigner means someone not from the area. Foreign, something unknown. So you see, foreigners were anyone who wasn't Chinese. So that means people from Arabia, from Persia, Spain, Africa. Those are going to be some of the predominant places where we're going to see people coming. But even Europeans, such as Marco Polo, are going to have high positions in Mongol society during the Wan period of China. Finally, we have the northern Chinese. And when I say finally, finally we're getting to the people of China. Uh, the northern Chinese, they dealt with the Mongols in the past. They had some restrictions on their freedom. They had some rights. But then we get to our southern Chinese. And they had very little freedom, very few rights. Soldiers would guard the streets and mistreat and abuse them. They didn't have freedom of travel. They didn't have um, many freedoms at all. They paid very high taxes and were mistreated by the Mongols. Now, what are the consequences of the Mongol rule of China? Well, the first thing was the end of the civil service examination system. Remember those tests to make sure you had the best people in government? Yeah, those are gone. You don't need the best, you just need to be Mongolian, or at least not Chinese, according to Kublai Khan. So, during the Sun period, we talked about how the scholar officials had great power in the society, these educated people making the decisions of China. Well, no longer do they have any power. In fact, the scholar officials get pushed to the side. Many of them don't survive the Mongol conquest. Um, some of them go and try to lead rebellions. As I said, there weren't enough Mongols for the government jobs. They were illiterate, they were uneducated, unskilled. So therefore, we have foreigners coming. The most common places that foreigners are going to come from to serve in the Mongol court would be India, Persia, Arabia, West Africa. Now, they eventually realized in the later one that it wasn't enough to have someone working for your government just because they weren't Chinese. Uh, you're not getting the best workers that with that kind of criteria. So therefore, they do bring back the civil service examinations. However, uh, it was unfair. So for example, if you're Mongolian and you wanted to take the test, you have your test in Mongolian. And they'd probably just give you the job either way. If you were a foreigner and you were Italian, like Marco Polo was, they might give you a test in Italian. If you're Portuguese, in Portuguese. Uh, if you are Persian, it might be in a Persian language, like Farsi. If you're uh, from 
on the Arabian Peninsula, it would be in Arabic. However, if you were in Chinese, if you were Chinese and you tried to take the test, maybe yours would be in Arabic. Maybe your test would be in Italian. Maybe half of it in Portuguese. I didn't know to pass a test when you can't even speak the language. And you might be thinking, well, maybe they learned the languages. No, the Chinese were forbidden to study foreign languages. Now, the Mongols were hated, they were revolted against, and um, for good reason. Here we see the Silk Road, something that we're going to have each of our Chinese dynasties using. Uh, the Mongols are going to use it even more. They are going to improve upon the Silk Road. So we see one of the things that they're going to do is they're going to set up posts every 20 miles. These posts were great because it's just like a rest stop today. They can stop, get food, they can sleep, maybe change out their horses, get food for their animals. It was something to make traveling the Silk Road safer. With those posts, there would be guards posted there. And of course, those guards were going on patrols to protect against bandits. So therefore, the Silk Road was able to be used extensively during the Wan period of China. Also, they're going to use many, many water routes to go maximize as much trade. While they're doing that, they're getting items and they're bringing along ideas. So we're going to have Chinese ideas like gunpowder and printing being traded for Persian knowledge of astronomy, mathematics. Remember, we had our Arabian Golden Age going before this. And during that time, many discoveries, inventions are going to be figured out in the Arabic world. And, of course, we just talked about how many discoveries and inventions were created during in the Chinese world. That's going to have this cross-pollination, this spreading of ideas. So we're going to see some real cultural flourishing um, with along that Silk Road. Um, for example, Beijing is going to wind up actually being built by foreign architects, primarily Persian, but some Arabic. We're going to see just a great time of culture and technological improvements during this. But it all came at a cost. Now, like I said, the Mongols, or the Wan, as they wanted to be called, were incredibly unfair to the Chinese. For example, if you were a Mongolian merchant, you can go anywhere you wanted in China. You could trade anything you wanted, with the exception of silkworms, um, and the knowledge of how to make silk, the sericulture, that was still a guided secret. That actually, if you tried to trade that, um, it was typically the death penalty. Marco Polo's uncle almost got stuck with that. But, as I was saying, you could go anywhere, trade anything, with exception of silkworms, and you didn't have to pay taxes. However, if you were Chinese, you could not go anywhere. You could go certain places at certain times. You could only trade certain goods, and in the end, you paid many taxes. As we had mentioned earlier, the government, although ruling China, didn't speak Chinese. Chinese were forbidden to learn foreign languages. The primary languages used in the Chinese government at this time were going to be Mongolian and Arabic. So the Chinese are going to dislike this, and they are going to rebel rebel, rebel, even do it going as far as assassinating uh, Mongolian officials. This is going to lead to the rise of the Ming Dynasty, which we're going to get into in a few days. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Bye-bye.